time to get the dumb thing off of mine. Hello, this is David Cox. I'm the director of the library and the Office for Student Learning, and we're just thrilled to have Dr. Daniel Jones with us, who is uh, with Earth and Environmental Sciences, and he's a Splunker and a few other things. And uh, as a Splunker, I'm interested in what he's got to say. And uh, it sounds like uh, it's fun because uh, Cave and Karst, so to speak, are big things uh, right now. And uh, so we're celebrating all that. So go ahead, Dan, give us a, a preview of who you are. Okay. Yeah, so my name's Dan. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science. And I'm also the academic director of something called the National Cave and Karst Research Institute. Yay. That I will, yeah, that I will, I'll, I'll introduce properly in a bit. And so my research is um, uh, in the field. So I, I study caves and karst and I, my specialty is something called geomicrobiology, which is the cool. subdiscipline of the earth sciences that addresses how microorganisms impact geological processes. And so, mm -hmm. um, so there's the brief introduction. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> No, I mean, we'll get you started here. Tell me why this whole field opened up for you and why you love it. Oh, that's a great question. So I got into caving and cave science from the science end. So this is, and I have some slides I can I can show if you please if you feel like. Free. But um, when I was in undergrad, I was talking to one of my professors. So I took a geomicrobiology class and I was you know, I just kind of opened my eyes to this, the, the ways that bacteria and other types of microbes can, can um, impact rocks and minerals. And, and so we went to this, um, as I ended up doing a, a summer research experience, and we went to a cave system out in Italy that has active sulfuric acid production. And, you know, the reason we're there, because the microorganisms are a, a big part of that, mm -hmm. um, but it was, you know, it was scientifically fascinating, and the, the cave was spectacular, and um, it just kind of all all clicked. And so I ended up doing my my dissertation in that. And here did I you am. have to wear a gas mask in there because of the sulfuric acid? Um, some of them you do, and some of them you don't. It depends yeah. how it depends how dynamic it is. So yeah, I I wasn't sure. Yeah, I've I've read about these strange places in Antarctica, for example, that people are starting to get into. Uh, just simply because of the, you know, uh, climate change and warming where they're starting to go into different uh, types of caves that they haven't been able to be in before. So, I mean, uh, I'm assuming that uh, for you, uh, that might be fun, but other caves, uh, certainly. Uh, and uh, tell us, tell us another one of your stories. I like the one about Italy. Another story. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Oh, boy. I, you can just um, choose one. It's okay. Tell a, a story off the off the cuff like that. Oh, um, come we'll on! Tell you. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll tell you what I have some. Um, I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but I put together a, a short presentation. Would you like me to? No, that would that? work just yeah. fine. And okay. then tell stories as you go through it. Yeah, I was going to say I might I might rely on some visual aids for some. For students stories. that are watching, this is really an exciting field. And I think I think people uh, have really who get into it just enjoy it, and that's why I'm giving Dan such a bad time. But uh, go ahead, Dan. Uh, can we can we make sure he can share there, Katie? Yeah, I should be all set up. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, oops, what's going on? Well, it looks like good stuff there. This is my yeah, that's my <laughs> yeah. Katie sent me the advertisement piece. Yeah. So I um. I thought that what I would do is talk a little bit about some of the um, some of the work that my group does in a very general sense, and then also talk a little bit about the the mm -hmm. Cave and Karst Studies Program here in the National Cave and Karst Research Institute. And I especially I wanted to highlight some. Let me pull my laser pointer here. Um, so I especially wanted to highlight some opportunities for New Mexico Tech students that sure. might be interested in this. That'd be great. So, um, so you just just stop me when you want me to tell a story or, or say a little bit more. How's that sound? Okay, everybody, everybody's listening. Jump in when that time happens. Okay. Okay, great. So I thought that I would start by explaining this word 
karst um, because I've said it several times and I haven't said what it is and it's a fairly jargony word. Oh, um, but actually before I do that, I wanna mention that, so 2021 is has been designated the International Year of Caves and Karst. And so this was, um, if you go to this website, iyck2021.org, the idea of the International Year is that it would be a, a year um, devoted to celebrating caves and the resources they provide and the other types of opportunities and sort of the reason that we love them. And so the there are a number of different activities. Um, we had hoped that a lot of these would be in person because, you know, if you can go in a cave, it's a lot more, it's a lot more interesting, but the pandemic had other ideas. And so there are um, a number of virtual events that you can check out. And then hopefully towards the end of the year, we'll have some more in-person options. And I think that, you know, we will, we will um, either officially or unofficially extend this into 2022, sort of with an eye towards doing things that we can't do um, in person at the moment. So karst is, um, karst is the landscape that you get when um, that landscape is forming on soluble bedrock. So what you're looking at here, this is an example of a karst terrain or a, um, uh, a series of karst features. And these are, so these are limestone spires. This is the stone forest in Southern China. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And these are made out of a rock type called limestone. And limestone is a rock that dissolves easily in, in, um, in uh, slightly acidic water. So rainwater, um, rainwater is basically pure, but it takes up a little bit of CO2 from the atmosphere. And that CO2 forms a weak acid called carbonic acid. And you can see in these limestone spires, you can see these grooves cut through the side. These are um, grooves cut by that um, cut by rainwater. And so this is, this is the result of having a, a, a soluble, um, a soluble rock, a soluble starting um, place, if you will. So the other way to think about karst is that karst is cave country. So this is another type of karst landscape. This is something that is more akin to, you know, what you might find in a place like Southern Minnesota, for example. Um, which is where the, the, the authors, uh, my colleagues that, that generated this figure. And so this is, this is the earth, there's been a slice cut through this. And so this is more limestone, the same rock from the previous slide. Here are the caves. So the caves are the voids, the underground voids that are big enough for a human to go into. Um, and here's another one. So this is one that's sort of actively forming as this river flows through it. So these are the, the caves are the voids karst is everything else so karst is everything else um, the the rest of the the landscape or the rest of this terrain and so how water flows through you know if you can dissolve out big underground voids you can move a lot of water through it really really quickly this type of landscape has some really types of some unique properties so um i will i will tell a story for David on this next slide, what I thought I would do is talk about a, a particular type of cave that me and my group focus on. And so, um, and one of our one of our main field sites is this is the one in Italy that I mentioned at the start, the Frassassi cave system. And this is a cave. So Frassassi is a unique cave. It is, you know, most of the caves, most caves, most limestone caves form by um, the aggressive action of carbon of carbonic acid, which is a weak acid, this what, ha what you get when you dissolve CO2 into water. But for Sassi was actually formed to a large extent by sulfuric acid. And this is an unusual process, but as you can see, so this is an image from the from the tourist level of Frassassi. So Frassassi, it's kind of like the Carlsbad Caverns of Italy. It's the, the most popular show cave in Italy. It gets um, a, a few hundred thousand visitors a year, at least in a, a non-pandemic year. And this, you know, this cluster of, of um, stalagmites here is, you know, probably twice the size of my home office, the base of it that could easily fill that. So this chamber, to give you a sense of scale, this, this, um, stalagmite in the back here. This is about three meters tall. So this is a this is an underground chamber that's large enough to fit the Cathedral of Milan. And the story I was going to tell is it's not one of my stories, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, but the actually the only natural entrance to this cave is right on top of this room. So the first explorers 
descended on cable ladders down into this void, this underground void that's, you know, 200 by 300 meters by, you know, um, uh, nearly 200 meters tall. So I imagine that was quite the experience. Now the tourists, now there's a, an entrance into the side of the mountain that gets you in here. So these caves, how, how this works is that these caves form uh, because of some unusual groundwater chemistry. So sulfuric acid caves, or I'll use this term sulfitic caves, they form where reduced sulfitic groundwater rises up to the water table. So this compound here, this is hydrogen sulfide. This is the, the gas that gives rotten eggs their rotten smell. Um, and so these waters are um, uh, anoxic water, so no oxygen, high levels of hydrogen sulfide. And then once they mix with oxygen, this happens at the cave water table commonly from fresh waters that infiltrate down from the surface or um, from cave air. And where sulfide and oxygen interact, sulfide is oxidized to sulfuric acid. And so that's how you get sulfuric acid in these caves because of this type of water. And so this is, um, this is an uncommon process. It's not a very, it's, it's, um, uh, it's not unique, but it's, it's a fairly rare cave forming process. But some of the largest and most spectacular caves in the world form because of this. So we have some of the best examples here in New Mexico. Carlsbad Caverns and Lechiquia Cave are the result of sulfuric acid corrosion in a, a similar type of mixing um, sulfitic groundwater fed regime. So one of the reasons, and this is part of the, this is how I got into studying these types of caves, is that um, they, they contain a lot of life. So this reaction, um, the oxidation of hydrogen sulfide, there's a lot of chemical energy in this reaction, and there are certain types of microorganisms that can live off the energy in that reaction in the same way that you and I live off organic carbon. So this is, um, there are, are um, bacteria that can make their living. So when, when well, I can, I can say it this way, when, when we humans eat sugar and breathe oxygen, what we're doing is oxidizing the, car the carbon in that sugar, and our waste product is carbon dioxide and water. Well, these organisms are, instead of oxidizing organic carbon, they're oxidizing sulfide. So they can be thought of as eating sulfide and breathing oxygen in their waste product rather than CO2 is sulfuric acid um, or some other form of sulfur. So here's what this looks like. This is, a, this is an image taken from right at the water table in the Frasasi cave system. So the, that same cave system. And this is a conduit that's bringing the sulfide charged groundwater up into contact with the cave air. And so this is creating a stream that's flowing along in this direction. And all of this white material that you can see here is this is a, a, a mat, a biofilm created by sulfide oxidizing bacteria. So if I zoom in on this white stuff, you can see it's it's kind of like a, it's like a carpet coating darker colored sediments. You can see there's some darker sediments here where um, you know we've we've disturbed it. And if you pull up a chunk of this material, if you look at it even closer, what you see is that this white stuff is is created by bacterial filaments. And so this is this is maybe a hundred or two hundred x magnification, and this is more like um, four hundred or even a thousand x magnification. And so these this strand here, this is a bacterial filament, um, a bacteria of the, um, the genus Begiatoa. And this is living off, this is one of the organisms that's living off sulfide. Um, it's getting its energy by oxidizing sulfide. So these organisms are chemosynthetic organisms and they support, um, you can see, and I'll just, I'll just make the comment that you can see there are all these, these um, white spheres inside this microbial cell. These are elemental sulfur that is being created by the organism that's stored inside a cell, it represents a stored energy source for the cell, but it also gives these, it also creates this, these striking white colors. And so these organisms, you know, that they're, well, for one thing, they're producing, um, they're producing sulfur compounds and they're, they're producing sulfuric acid. So they're contributing to acid production in the cave. And they also, I mean, you can see there's a lot of there's a lot of biomass here, and that supports higher organisms, including a number of animals. So this is some of the some of the um, animal life, invertebrate life in the streams. You can see there's some little red worms right here. This is a flatworm. So this is a they swim. They kind of look like ribbons when they swim. This is 
Um, this is an amphipod um, called Nefargus of the uh, Nefargus ictus, and this is this is actually the the most numerically abundant animal in the cave, as far as we know. And part of the reason it's so successful is because it has a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria that form, or the same types of bacteria that form these these white mats here. So this is a this is some work from a, a colleague of mine from grad school that. Um, uh, Sharmish Dada Gupta, she was a, a postdoc when I was a PhD student, and what she found is that if you zoom in really close, so this is the amphipod under a scanning electron microscope, and if you zoom in really close on this appendage here, it is, it appears to be, you know, cultivating this growth of bacterial filaments. So these are filamentous bacteria like the ones I just showed you, and there's a very specific association. And so um, we don't know whether they're farming them to eat or whether they're using them to detoxify the sulfide, which is a which is a toxic compound. But um, we we it's probably it may be some combination of the two. There's this specific association, and um, I'll also add that there are so in Frasassi there in in this particular cave in Italy, the the life forms or the the animals are. Um, Currently, all all invertebrates, but there's a cave in Mexico that actually supports. It has even more sulfide input than what than what we have at this particular cave, and actually supports a population of fish for part of the year. So even even vertebrates in in um, some cases, or at least in that one case. So this is a um, this is that same photo that I was showing. You can see all the white mats here. This is a schematic that's depicting some of the same processes that are that are going on in the um, in the uh, uh, in this area. And so, what you can see, what this shows, is that when sulfide enters this area, some of that sulfide stays in the stream. That provides energy for all this this white microbial material. But then also, some of that sulfide degasses into the atmosphere, and that provides energy for microbial life up in this area. And the part of that is that, so I just, I'm going to slap some pH values on this figure. The streams are, are circumneutral, are neutral conditions. You know, what we think of as, as, as normal pH values, not very acidic. But up, up in this area, there's a mineral precipitate that forms on the walls that's, a, that's left behind by the corrosion of this limestone by the, by the sulfuric acid. And so here you have you have high, you can you can have highly acidic microbial communities that that hang from the walls that are as low as pH zero. So these are you know our, our stomach acid is say around pH two or so. So these are these are um, extremely acid tolerant communities. So this is a figure. Or th this is a couple of photos of the of the you know what what it looks like right at the water table again. So you can see these these streams down here. Um, and here's another stream. And so you can see more of this white stuff. And these are areas where you have these fast flowing streams, you get a lot of sulfide degassing. And this is, we don't need to wear, um, David asked about safety gear at the start. We don't really need to add uh, to, to wear um, um, safety uh, you know, filters or, or spare airs or anything like that. For this particular cave, the sulfide doesn't get super high, but some others it can, and then you need a little bit more protection. But even, even, even though you know, we don't have to, um, it's, sulfide's not really exceeding OSHA limits and we're not there for very long, but um, even so this flux of sulfide results in, so up here, all of this, this white up on the walls, this is actually a mineral called, called gypsum. So if you corrode limestone with sulfuric acid, here's the chemical reaction, you form gypsum on the walls. And this area, this flux of, this flux of energy um, means that there is life all over the walls here. And that includes some of some highly acidic communities. And these are some images of those. And so the, these dangling biofilms, they're, they're called snotites. It's not too hard to see where that name comes from. So what you're looking at is this is a, this is a, a form of crystalline gypsum. Um, and then the snotites are these biofilms that, are, that, are, that look like they're dripping from the ends here. So this is, um, again, this is more of the gypsum and then the snotites are these structures. And so these are right around pH zero to one. Um, we, 
you know, they're, they're protected from any buffering. If these were to come, come into contact with, with limestone, they would, you know, the limestone would dissolve, but then it would neutralize the acid. But because they're, they're um, hanging free in the cave air, there's nothing really to stop them from getting um, extremely acidic. And so here's some, this is from a cave, in, a cave in Mexico that has a high sulfide flux and it has some very large and impressive snotites. And so these organisms, they're the, these are colonies of bacteria and um, archaea, which is another big class of microorganisms. And these, you know, in this cave, you can even see some places where the, the acid drips are actually dissolving grooves into the limestone underneath. So this is another, this is another piece of, of the, you know, sulf, um, sulfuric acid producing organisms that are contributing to the, the dissolution, the carving of the cave. So this is what the inside of uh, one of these snotites looks like. This is a, a snotite at a thousand X magnification. And just to show you that these, you know, these are colonies, these are densely packed colonies of, of microorganisms. And this is an image. So this is an image where I've used a fluorescent probe to tag uh, a bacteria called a city thiobacillus. And it's labeled red. All bacteria are labeled green, and so this this particular organism kind of comes out as this orange color. But the you can see some individual cells here, and this particular organism is is the main organism that's that's forming these. So this is another this is another image. This is from the the cave in Mexico. You can see these these you know much um, these these very large snotite biofilms. And these are some of the, the organisms that form these are some of the most acid tolerant microbes known. So this is, this is my, my um, grad student, Mackenzie Best. So Mackenzie just, she just finished a master's and she just started a PhD. We were really lucky to be able to keep her around. And she was, this is one of her cultures. So she's growing these organisms um, in our lab and she's growing them on elemental sulfur. That's what that yellow stuff is there. And, you, and if you Sort of squint just right. There, this is actually forming a little bit of snotite material in her culture, and she's grown them. She's grown them as low as pH of zero point two. So we're um, there is one organism known that can grow below a pH of zero. It can actually grow at a pH of negative zero point zero six. And so McKinsey's doing another experiment right now to see if we can get these guys growing even below zero. And so. They're um, the high acid tolerance, um, which makes them, you know, we're, we're interested in these organisms, not just because they're, they're an important piece of understanding the cave system, but there are, it's, I mean, anything that can grow at, at that low of a pH is, is inherently interesting in its own right. And there are also a lot of biotechnological and um, um, bioremediation type applications for extremely acid adapted organisms. So we're, um, my group studies a number of different aspects of the systems. So we've looked at, and actually this, this equipment that you can see here, this is, this is collecting profiles. It's actually measuring sulfide consumption and acid production within these white mats. So we've looked at um, what's, you know, what microbes are doing to sulfur down in this area. We've looked, we're, we've um, looked up here and we're, this is something we're really interested in, in continuing going forward. So you saw McKinsey's work on that. So we're interested in studying a number of different aspects of these types of systems. Um, I'll also add that one of the, oops. Uh, so this is an image of us actually accessing this site. So there's a stream down here. There's one of these degassing sulfitic streams and it requires, because of the um, sulfuric acid is a strong acid and it tends to carve out these really big chains. So you need a lot of rope work to get down to some of these places. But what this image also shows is that, you know, the, to, to, um, um, there's a lot of vertical travel and that's because the, this, this cave in particular has formed on multiple levels. And so it's, um, you can go, so the, the, if the sulfitic water table is staying in more or less the same place, it's, it's forming in an active mountain belt where the, um, so the Apennine Mountains are being uplifted. And so you can find older and older levels as you go further up. And what you see if you travel further up, you're basically traveling, um, you're looking at levels that were formed, um, say 100,000 years before or 200,000 years before. And you can see the cave system evolve. 
And so this is this is um, another one of my students. This is a, a Zoe Havlina is, a, is another PhD student. And you go from a situation like this where you have active sulfuric acid production, lots of snotites, lots of um, lots of microbial activity, um, to a, a condition where there's no more sulfitic water. And then a lot of these features start to be removed as you have other cave processes. So you get infiltrating water that can that can remove some of this. And so one of the things that, that Zoe's looking at as part of her PhD is this is from a level that's about 100,000 years old. And this is a massive gypsum deposit. So gypsum, it forms in these caves as this corrosion residue. Um, so gypsum is this is the this is the, the sand at white sands. It's the same mineral type. Um, in this case, it's forming in a very different process, but this it forms on the walls here um, and then it accumulates on the floor. And so Zoe's going to see this is part of a project that's that's funded by NASA. Zoe's going to see if there's um, whether this gypsum preserves evidence of the cave when it when it looked more like this rather than rather than this this um, sort of dried out version of it. And so this is one of these sulfuric acid caves, if you find this mineral gypsum, there's a there's a chance you've got a sulfuric acid cave. This is from Carlsbad Caverns. This is from the big room of Carlsbad Caverns. If any of you have ever been there, these are massive gypsum deposits. This is one of the clues that led people to to recognize how Carlsbad um, and some of the other caves in the in southeastern New Mexico formed. So. I'll just mention very briefly, we, we do more than um, um, caves are caves are a big part of what we do, but they're not the only part. This is we also look at. So this is a this is an image of a, a, a pyrotite crystal or some some sort of sulfide mineral and with microbes on the surface. So we're looking at how microbes are um, dissolving are eating this mineral. And this is this is to understand the um, some of the mineral oxidation processes that happen in mine waste. So this is mine waste from a site in Minnesota that that this sample was taken from. Um, I have a, a, a PhD student at the University of Minnesota. So I've been I should I should have said this at the start. I've been here for two years and I was at Minnesota before this. And so um, Catherine is, uses some magnetic techniques to understand these processes and um, and then I also have in addition. So I showed Zoe and McKinsey, but I also have um, um, a couple of undergrads. And um, one of them, Brianna, who's now a, a master's student at, at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, she was working on a project looking at um, extreme, so extreme organisms from the Valles Caldera up in northern New Mexico. So this is this is Brianna showing the she's showing the love that we all feel for sulfur on the inside, but we're just afraid to show it. Um, so you can see this pure joy here, and here's some sulfur from that site. So I can maybe I can maybe pause and take a breath here, but I, I wanted to spend a few slides talking about the Nickery and, and some of the opportunities at NMT. I'll let you I'll let you moderate me a little more, David. No, no, that's fine. I uh, want to make sure that people get a chance to ask questions. I just find all this fascinating. And I'm sure others do as well. Are there some questions anybody has that they'd like to direct to Dr. Jones? Sounds like you've just wowed them, Dan. That's all I'm going to say. I, I apologize. This is Sarah. I arrived late. I was in another meeting. Sorry. Maybe you've already gone over this, but how'd you get into caves? How did, how, yeah. What is, how did you end up here? I guess, you know, what's yeah. your background? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, be honest, um, um, being in caves, um, it makes me a little claustrophobic. So I don't know how, how did you discover that, you know, yeah, there are fun places to be. Yeah, so I got into caves uh, because of science, basically, because they were a cool place to study um, microbes and the, the ways that microbes can dissolve rock and impact geologic processes. And so my background is actually in uh, my my undergrad degree is in geology, and at the end of my at the end of my time in undergrad, I did a, a summer research experience with with one of my professors and ended up working in the caves that I was just talking about. And that sort of, that, um, you know, they're just a, 
they're, I mean, caves are, caves are a, a wonderful place to recreate, but they're also a wonderful place for, for scientific discovery. And, and so that's how I got into it. And I ended up going to, so then I went to grad school at Penn State in geomicrobiology is my field. So I was still in a geosciences department, but, you know, most of, you know, my research feels a lot more biological in a lot of ways. I mean, so even if it's the end, end goal is to understand this, you know, geologic process of cave formation, but we, you know, to do that, to, to study the, the activity and the processes of the microbes that do it is involves as much chemistry and as much biology as, as anything else. And so I actually got into bioinformatics and I do a lot of genome analysis now. And so after I was, so I, I uh, defended my PhD in 2011, and then I moved to the University of Minnesota for a postdoc. And, and that I was looking at microorganisms in, in, um, in a marine setting in marine upwelling zones. But I also, so I did that for a few years and then I got, I became the, the an industry liaison and a, a program coordinator for a state funded bioremediation in, initiative. And so the, um, it was sort of a logical, and I don't have a good slide that shows this, but but it was, it was sort of a logical move to go from studying um, extremely acid adapted cave microbes to looking at acidic coal mine drainage and um, acidic mine related environments. And so I did um, some of that work when I was in Pennsylvania and I, I um, started doing some more mining related work when I was in Minnesota. And so um, I, I was the, um, so I was in that position for a little while and then I, I moved out here in December of 2018. So I've been here for just a little over two years now. Um, I don't know if that may have been a little more than you were asking, no, but th th you know, I'm always interested in <laughs> yeah. how people got to where they are today. So thanks. <laughs> yeah. And so my Other position questions. here is, oh, yeah. Dan, I'm turning on my microphone on and off because I had some interference that was coming into the, the system here. So, uh, but uh, I mean, I, I wonder about different types of uh, gas that comes up through caves that is uh, from the earth. Uh, you ever have to deal with things like radon or things like that in the cave work? Yeah, you do. Um, and that's something that so one of, and actually the, the cave where this type of process was discovered was um, it's, it's uh, sitting on top of some shales that are a source of radon. And so some caves, you do have to worry about that. So if you have a, a big source of uranium, you can potentially have, have higher levels. And so that's something, and that's something that's, that's more of a concern just for the, you know, the, the health of the scientists. It doesn't necessarily impact the, the, the cave itself. The other, I mean, the really, you know, the in the caves that we work in, the dangerous gas is actually, um, I mean, sulfide is, sulfide, you know, too much of it is is not good, but um, carbon dioxide is actually the big concern because we can't, we can't easily filter it out. And it, you know, it, it a lot of, I mean, some high levels of CO2. So one of my Italian colleagues measured two and a half percent CO2 in a cave, which is, you know, that means you're, that means you have very low oxygen as well. And this was a cave that he was, you know, that he was working in. And so that's, that's the one that we really check for. So we have gas monitors. Um, we have, we have filters that take out sulfide and take out some of the other gases if we need them. And in some cases, so that cave in Mexico that I showed, we, we actually carry small pony bottles, um, like spare airs, like you would use for scuba diving if you needed to get out of, if you needed fresh air and needed to get out of somewhere quickly. So there, there are, um, there are real safety concerns in most of the time. I mean, in, in, in the, the, the Italian cave that I that I showed, most of the safety that you're worried about is actually has to do with the rope work to get into those places. So there, you can't, the cave walls are quite muddy, so you're not really climbing, but you're going up and down ropes. And that that's that's the big safety issue that we that we deal with in that um, in that context. Sounds like you have to be pretty fit to pull those things off in the larger sections. Um, you don't, I'm, I'm getting progressively less and less fit and I've still been able to go in. So let's, let's hope you don't have to be too fit. 
it was, um, yeah, when I was a younger grad student, it could cram myself into uncomfortable places for long periods of time. It certainly, it certainly helped, but there's, uh, caving is for everyone. Even for old guys like me. Exactly. Um, the, uh, the uh, other questions, anybody, before Dan goes into another section of his thoughts for us. Okay, Dan, if I'm a student coming to New Mexico Tech and I'm not sure about different programs I might want to be involved in, but I like geology in general, mm -hmm. how would you, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, connect me up to things, uh, yeah. either research or, or classes or whatever? How, how, take this take this uh, freshman who has just got big eyes and how would you deal with it? yeah well i would i would tell them i mean first of all i would i would tell them to take a geology course so either our one of our introductory level courses um and then the other best piece of advice is reach out to your professors and ask their advice you know if there's a professor that that talks about something that you're interested in chat with them and so this is how um um, there, a lot of professors have research opportunities or they're willing to make them. Um, and sometimes it just takes, you know, it just takes the, um, you taking the initiative to chat with them. And if they can't, you know, if they don't have the bandwidth or the, if they don't have the, the funding for a research project, they might be able to, to, you know, um, suggest other avenues you might pursue. So, you know, I, I, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's as I think it's as simple as that. And then I would also recommend, you know, talk to your talk to your friends and talk to your colleagues and don't be shy about about emailing, you know, department chairs or or professors to ask them what their classes are are all about and where they should get started to kind of explore this this interest. Sounds like a good place to start anytime to talk to the professor and see what's up. It, it, it is interesting to me, at least toward Lumitar, I think there's, you know, a fair amount of uh, heavy metal uh, in different places. Um, and, and so depending on where you are in a cave or karst areas, uh, the, the, the real question I think is, is that you, in this area, there's, there's many opportunities uh, to, to be involved in a, uh, geological studies and uh, whether it be uh, water patterns or, you know, for uh, dealing with uh, uh, just uh, even north of us here, a lot of underground types of water. And even through the campus, there's underground water, I have a feeling. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's kind of an exciting concept just to me that uh, people could get involved in hydrology here. They could get involved, uh, like you were saying, with uh, microorganisms. Uh, uh, again, I'm just thinking of allowed for a student. Uh, uh, how many different types of things could they get involved in? I, I'm thinking that you probably have things with magma. You've got other processes going on. Just, yeah. just give us the smorgasbord. Yeah, I mean, so in, in our department, in the earth science department, we have um, we have, you know, like you were saying, we have a, a big hydrology group. So we have folks that study water and all of the things it does. We have um, uh, folks that study. So we have um, a group of geochemists that includes economic geologists um, and and volcanologists that are that are, you know, we have we have both. Of, we, we have. Yeah, like, like you said, we have a lot of mineral deposits in the state and we have, I mean, we have folks that that we're we're a fairly we're a fairly broad department. Um, one of the other, I'll I'll just mention a, another opportunity that we collaborate really closely with a lot of folks from the New Mexico Bureau of Geology, and they hire a lot of undergraduates to do. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of employment opportunities with them if you're looking for something for say a few hours a week, or if you want to get interested. You know, if you really um, want to separate minerals for the for the argon lab or if you want to um, 
you know, there's sort of uh, learn a little bit more about it. That's another opportunity. And then I'll also add, and this is, I can, and I'll, I'll show my specifics. So we have some funding through, through my, my program to fund undergraduate research. There is little, there are funding sources around that are basically designed to create research opportunities for you while you, while you're, um, um, Doing your, your undergraduate research. So one of those, I mean, there's there's funding through Michael Vogel's office for the Alliance for Minority Participation. Um, he has a lot of great great um, grants that are that are really designed to to get folks um, create research opportunities. I've I've mentored students that have that have taken advantage of that. And then we also have a little bit of funding through the the Cave and Car Studies program here. And so if I can if I can segue, is it a good time to segue into that? Uh, segue yeah. away. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So my position here is a little bit different. So I'm a, I'm a normal assistant professor for all intents and purposes, but I'm also the academic director of the National Cave and Karst Research Institute. So that means that I'm in charge of, so this is the, the headquarters for NICRI. This is the acronym for, yeah, it's written up here. It's located in Carlsbad because that's close to Carlsbad Caverns. Um, this was it was actually created by an act of Congress, and they function as a as a or I should say we function as a research institute of of New Mexico techs. And so I'm here in Socorro. I'm um, I do the the college level academic side of things. But then so George Venny, this picture is a little out of date. You'll have to forgive me. But George Venny is the executive director of NICRI. He's down in Carlsbad, and there's a group of about seven folks, including an education director, a few a few scientists. Um, and so there are opportunities, you know, there are um, potentially opportunities both here, but also in the southeastern part of the state as well. And so I have a few slides just so I'm in charge of the cave and car studies program here, um, based out of the geology department, and we have my slides not advancing. Why isn't this? There we go. So we have um, a few different opportunities and um, a few different other activities that, that are, part of, are part of the Cave and Car Studies program. So I'll put my contact information up, but one of the things, at least in the before times, we would do is we, we host um, a couple seminars each semester. So this was a seminar from Jen McAlady from Penn State. She gave a, a talk on the same cave system, and these are um, and visited for a couple of days this is really before time material now, but you know we we um, had a barbecue. This was for another after another one of our speakers. You know this is <laughs> you can, yeah. But definitely before times, right? Um, I recognize but, some people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mentioned funding opportunities. We have so this is this is uh, a program called Undergraduate Research Opportunities in Caves and Karst, which has the acronym UROC. I'm very proud of this acronym. This is my primary accomplishment since coming here is, is creating that acronym. And this is so you can um, you can apply for this. It's it's fifteen hundred dollars. So it's designed to be enough to fund an undergraduate researcher for uh, about ten hours a week for a semester. So um, the way that this works is you um, approach one of your professors, ask them if they would like to, so that the research project has to be cave or karst themed in some way, um, but approach one of your professors and ask them if there's any, you know, tell them that you're interested in this and, if, and ask if they are, um, if they'd like to work on a cave or karst related project. And then you, you the, the student, writes a three page proposal. So a short, a short proposal proposing your idea. Um, you're the faculty mentor that you approached um, serves as your mentor for this. And um, then the, the um, award comes in a couple of different forms. So it's designed to create an, incent an incentive, uh, a way to, to create research funding, um, both to incentivize students to get involved in this line of work and for them to pressure all of the different um, professors or staff across campus to get into this type of work as well. And so, you know, there's there's cave and karst related research going on, not just in my department, but in the biology department. So Tom Kieft has students working on um, a couple different cave critter related projects. And then 
Um, so there are a couple of a couple of professors in mechanical engineering that are looking at drone technologies for for cave exploration. And so, you know, it's it's um, cave science is incredibly diverse. You know, caves are so caves are important archaeological re repositories. For example, you know, a lot of a lot of the important archaeological and paleontological deposits come from caves. Caves are also, you know, I mentioned groundwater before. The way that water moves through limestone through through karst terrains is very different. And so, um, here's an example. Of this one one that I had handy, and this was actually something I cribbed from a, a talk that I gave at UNM Valencia. So um, Keith Deagle is a, a UNM Valencia alum, um, transferred to Tech, and is now, um, and I believe he's doing a master's currently in mineral engineering. But he worked on uh, a UROC project related to, this was related to um, cave formation in the Carlsbad area with an eye towards the evolution of some of the petroleum deposits in the area. So this is an opportunity and this I will, so I will send this out. There's a, so a deadline about two months away from now, um, a little bit more, so time to, Trap a trap one of your professors and see if they'd be interested in in mentoring you for this. Um, and this is also there'll be another call. So this is for fall and summer funding, but there'll be another call at the end of the summer for additional fall funding. And so we can fund a couple of these a semester. And we haven't really funded this last year just because there hadn't been as much research. Uh, going on and it's just things are challenging as as you're all aware but um now we're we're excited to to support some more students and so so this is this is one opportunity and then i will mention um another opportunity that i'm really excited about so this is the this is the um, announcement for a communications internship program and what this is so this this is and i, I will formally announce it on friday but you're all getting a sneak peek of it this, this came out of a, a partnership with Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. So one of my colleagues there, they, Blue Marble Space has a young scientist program. They have a number of different internships with a, uh, a number of different folks that collaborate with the Institute. And one of my colleagues does a communications internship. Uh, the way he runs it is as, is as an unpaid internship, but we are able to leverage some of the Cave and Car Study Funds to make it a paid internship for New Mexico Tech students. So what it is, is it's over the summer, it'll be done remotely. Um, you'll work with, if you're, if you're awarded this, you would work with, um, or you would, you would get some communications training and mentorship from Graham, who's the communications, he's, um, I'm forgetting his exact title, but I believe he's the, and maybe it's in here, he's either the communications director or one of the communications specialists for, for Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. And he does um, some weekly trainings on the communications ends of things. And then the communications projects would be something cave related, sort of with an eye towards the international year of caves and karst. And so, you know, it could be, could be a podcast, could be, um, um, you know, it's all, all, to, all sort of to science communication. So I'm, I'm not the target, you know, the, the target audience is the general public. And so, um, um, writing short articles, maybe video logging, a graphic design piece, something like that. We're, we're, we're quite flexible and it depends on your interests. And so it's meant to be, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, meant to be about five hours a week with, with this here. Um, and we provide a stipend of about a of a thousand dollars for the summer, and so it wouldn't, you know, it, it would be sort of the kind of thing you could you could supplement your your day job with over the over the course of the summer if you're taking classes over the summer. So something to keep you going with with this program, and hmm. also keep you going when you're trying to do everything else. Um, if you look at the next, uh, let's say, 18 months as uh, COVID-19, hopefully, maybe in the next six, we'll get to a point of some sort of manageability. Uh, what are some uh, what are some uh, programs out of New Mexico Tech that you're going to be involved in along with this uh, that students might be interested in? Is there anything you can identify or? Um, um, what, and what do you mean by programs specifically? Well, I'm just thinking about as you're looking past 
the COVID-19 time, uh, is there, are there things that you've been waiting on, things that you have been wanting to do, but uh, maybe have been held back on? Uh, what, what, what are some of those types of things that you think will erupt, let us say, as, as COVID-19 yeah. gets a little less? Yeah, well, so some of the some of the areas we we would like to go, especially with programs like this, are one one thing I'm I'm hoping to do is is um, build a better bridge to southeastern New Mexico. You know, there's just so many cool research opportunities down there, and we have NICRI headquarters down there. So I'd like to create more opportunities for tech students to um, work with other NICRI folks. You know, besides myself and and. There are, I mean, there are a number of different sci interesting scientific questions you can ask whether you're a geomicrobiologist or, or, or a hydrologist or, or any of the above. So that's, that's one thing. And then another thing that I'm, I'm especially interested in, so NICRI's, part of NICRI's mandate is research, of course, but part of it is also stewardship and education. And, you know, there may be opportunities to, so we're, we're currently I'm going to start searching for a, a, a new education director. And so there may be opportunities to work on projects, you know, not necessarily research as I do, but on, on stewardship or education related projects through, through, um, you know, in, in sort of broader collaboration with, with NICRI. Um, so that's certainly one. And another one is just doing more research, <laughs> um, to being able to travel and do workshops and conferences again. Um, yeah, it would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, the, yeah. you know, my archaeology side comes out, of course, when I'm looking at what you're doing. And as you say, there are a number of different archaeological types of processes in, in caves and other locations. Uh, and uh, I'd just be interested to see if archaeology gets to climb up a little bit more into some of what you're doing. Uh, just because of my own background, but that's also pretty exciting in the midst of cave study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also just add, I actually just published a paper uh, last year with some colleagues from the University of Minnesota that sort of I fortuitously got into where they were looking at, um, they're looking at a Paleolithic site in Montenegro, and they were interested in understanding basically whether or not microorganisms were messing with some of their archaeological data and it's you know it's it's situated in the karst region of montenegro this was a, a rock fort where all of these you know this this um, um sort of wonderful collection of 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 neanderthal and um sort of things of of uh things of that time frame and i know i mean i know very little about archae archaeology but i thought it was a, a Cool opportunity to get involved in some of that, and and you know from from my perspective as a as a cave scientist and, and microbiologist, and so I think that that's one of the. I mean, I think yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I'll also just add future plans, which is, and I I am realizing I forgot to make a slide about this, but I'm offering a a um, cave and karst class this fall that'll be taught at the 200 level. So introduction to caves and karst. And when I, what I would really like to do with the class is, um, you know, it, it's a, a normal class has a lecture component, but then I would like to do some field trips as part of that. And it would be nice if we could go spend, you know, a weekend down in Carlsbad, see Carlsbad caverns and some of the other features, or maybe go, I, you know, I haven't said anything about lava caves, but there are, are lava caves um, up north of us. And so right now the, I mean, I'm, I'm doing field trips in my current class, but, you know, the last field trip we went on was we had um, eight students, uh, we had eight students, seven students drove themselves and one student rode and all the way in the back of a 15 passenger van that was driven by the TA. So we had, you know, nine vehicles for 10 people and that gets a little trickier when you're, you know, <laughs> going all the way to southeastern New Mexico. And so hopefully that we'll be able to do a, a cave class that has uh, more of a field component and can be a little bit more hands on and actually get to see and experience some of these some of these locations. So that is that like a three credit class you're going to have? So it's a it's listed as a two credit class. Um, and I think if I was I, I would have listed it as three credits, but I I'm pretty wary about whether or not we're actually going to be able to do some of those field trips right now. So um, if we, you know, if we spend a whole weekend in the Carlsbad area, that's, 
that that would be the the third credit is the the way I would like to teach it. So we've decided I've decided just to do it as a two credit for for now, and then hopefully in the future we can we can um, uh, do a little bit more of that. I mean everything's very uncertain, so it may it may still be possible, but. Well, I find it all very exciting, and I hope that our listeners have as well, uh, because uh, this is one of the, I think, the bedrock types of uh, of uh, programs we have here is geology with mining and other interests, and uh, it's exciting to uh, uh, see you have so much fun, and to uh, see you light up when you talk about this stuff, because uh, this is a really uh, insightful type of a of a program to deal with microorganisms and, and the whole process of, of the karst studies. Uh, just want to say thank you to you because uh, we're coming up to the end of our time. And uh, if there's one last comment from anybody, I'm going to give you your shot. So here you go. I'm, and I'm happy to stick around and ask answer questions for a little bit longer if the if the Zoom can stay on. Otherwise, not to worry. I may be bombarded by children at some point, but. <laughs> I had a thought about that, but I'm going to just keep it. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe what? Yeah. Why don't I stop my screen share and I'll, we can put it back to a gallery view here if I can do such a thing. Yeah. So, yeah. And I'll, I'll um, look for, look for an email, send out an email campus wide uh, with, with some of these programs. So look for that on either end of this week or early next week. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I don't know, Katie, do you want to try to transfer this to Dan? Can we do that with the hosting or something? I'm sorry, what do I need the transfer, the hosting? Yeah, I was thinking the hosting, just in case somebody might want to ask questions of Dan, uh, and we can go off of the recording, uh, something like that, if anybody might be interested. Okay. Katie knows all these things. She I'll knows stop recording. Things.